Thank you for coming, everybody. Um, so my name's Rose, and to give you a little bit of a background info, my role is the Student Health and Wellbeing Promotions Coordinator. So um, it's made up of a few different things, my role. Um, one of which being is I promote the wellbeing department um, at La Trobe, which encompasses all campuses. So I'm primarily based in Bandura, but I can be based anywhere really. Um, and wellbeing is made up of different services, which I'll talk about a bit later. And I coordinate with all of them to promote the services to students. Um, so another part of my job is I also coordinate and run health and wellbeing events on the national calendar. So for example, are you a K day that just um, went? I organized a lot of the resources for that. Um, University Mental Health Day was um, back in lockdown 1.0. And we did um, this great video of staff and students about what they were doing in lockdown um, to keep entertained and to cope. That was really nice too. Um, and then the third part of my role is, um, depending on what sort of health and wellbeing concerns are happening in the community or in the world right now, um, so I plan and run health and wellbeing initiatives um, to do with them. So at the moment, obviously it's the pandemic. Um, so I'm doing a lot of resilience talks um, and tips and tricks to promote um, coping during the pandemic, basically. So that's kind of my focus at the moment. And resilience is just one of my passions, so this lined up perfectly, which is really good. Um, before we begin, let's see some more things. Um, the La Trobe University acknowledges the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations as the traditional custodians of the land upon which the Melbourne campus is located. We recognise their ongoing connection to the land and value the unique contribution to the Wurundjeri people and all Indigenous Australians to make the university and the wider Australian society. So just a bit of housekeeping. Um, so the session will run for about 30 to 40 minutes. Um, if you have any questions, you can feel free to interrupt me at any time or put them into the chat box and I can answer them at the end. Um, I just wanna point out as well that I'm not a trained counsellor, like my background is in public health. Um, so this is very generic, but good advice. So just um, keep that in mind as well. I can't give individual tailored advice, but please always seek professional help if you need it because that's what they're there for. And that brings me to, so I'll just start off this um, session with talking a little bit about our health and wellbeing supports and services um, at La Trobe before we get into the resilience stuff. So um, our wellbeing services are made up of six services and Respect at La Trobe, which is a commitment to Respect at La Trobe. Um, at the moment during COVID lockdowns, um, we're all operational and available via Zoom or phone appointments. So you can still jump on our website and book all those appointments. Um, the cat up, oh, sorry, all of our services are free to students as well. So every single one they're free, you don't have to pay anything. Um, so I'll start off with counselling. So counselling is free and confidential short-term counselling. Um, and you have access to specialist programs um, such as our queer program and our queer counsellor and our men's wellbeing um, counsellor. And we have a team of psychologists, social workers and specialist counsellors so that to support all sorts of students across all of the campuses. Um, and in addition to individual counselling, we have um, an out of hours crisis line that is available to students. So if you can't get to our counsellors between nine to five, you can always call our crisis line as well. Um, I can put that up for you at the end of the slide or you can jump on our website. It's um, operational from, from 5 p.m. to 9 a.m. in the morning. So out of hours and weekends and public holidays. So you can always call or text them as well. They have a text services, which is good. Um, and you can see the counsellors about any concerns that you have. So they don't have to be traditionally, traditionally people when they think of counselling, they think you need to have a big issue to go and see a counsellor, but they don't have to be big issues. Um, you can talk to them about anything that's bothering you, like lack of motivation, procrastination, grief, loss or trauma, relationship difficulties, conflicts at home, poor class attendance, like anything that's bothering you. Um, the only thing is sometimes there can be a little bit of a wait time um, to get an appointment, just depending on the time of semester. But um, when you do book an appointment, they give you a call back within um, a 
few days, I think it is. And that's called a triage call just to check, um, to grab some more details and to check up on you. And then they book you into appointment then. So um, they'll be able to tell you then if there's a wait time. And if you would prefer to go elsewhere for a shorter wait time, um, they can help you with resources as well. So always definitely come to us as a point of contact and we can either book you in um, or, you know, direct you to other resources as well. Um, so the next of our services um, is accessibility. So this until really recently was formally um, equity and diversity. Um, and they support students with a disability, a medical condition or mental health illness, um, or students with prime, as, who are primary carers or with a refugee background. So when we think of a disability, we think of a physical disability, generally like someone in a wheelchair, but it can also relate to um, intellectual, psychiatric, sensory learning, neurological disabilities. So they also look after mental ill health, people with mental ill health, because people aged um, 18 20 to 24, one in four people are affected by a mental illness. And this is the greatest of any uh, um, age group. And this is predominantly our student population as well. So it's not surprising to hear that these sorts of issues are prominent in our La Trobe community as they would be in any other age group there. So um, if you do see accessibility, they will help you with what's called a learning access plan or a LAP for short. And you'll see a count, you'll book in with a disability advisor and they will, you'll talk to them about your disability and then they'll fill out this form that's a learning access plan, but they don't actually write in your um, health issue or condition. Um, and then you then take that form and that's when you give it to other, your lecturers um, and your teachers, and then they can exempt you or help you accommodate your disability or um, illness or whatever it may be, but it won't be disclosed on that form. It'll just show you the adjustments that they is need to make. Um, so Speak Up is our other service. So this is where you go to report um, unacceptable or concerning behaviour. Um, and this could happen in person um, to somebody else. It could happen on campus. It could happen off campus. It could happen on placement or even in your personal life with no connection to uni. So if you're a student, you can access Speak Up, speak up for any concern that you have. Um, it's not an emergency service, so it's called triple zero. But if you need to get in touch with them, they'll be um, very helpful and it can either be anonymous, anonymously or on the records. So even if you see something that you don't know um, what it's about, like that happens on campus or off campus, you can still call Speak Up and they can talk you through what happens next or do a welfare check on the person in question, for example. Um, An unacceptable behaviour could be anything from bullying, discrimination, harassment, including sexual harm, um, stalking or violence. So anything unacceptable, really. The Wellbeing Connect and Check-In during COVID-19. So um, the check-in service is um, an initiative that was set up by, as a result of COVID-19. So um, during the pandemic, and it's run by the Wellbeing Connect staff. So during the pandemic, students can contact our Wellbeing Check-in service. And it's basically you fill in a form online and they give you a call back. Um, and it's, it's kind of for people who aren't sure what kind of help that wellbeing support they need and they might not think that they need to talk to a counsellor. So it could just be that they need a chat to somebody or a bit of advice. Um, and then that person on the end of the phone can then direct them to the resource they need. Or it might be determined that maybe you do need a counselling appointment and that's perfectly fine. They'll book you in with a counsellor. So um, that's our wellbeing check-in support. Like it's for whenever you, you're not quite sure what support you need, or you just need to have a chat to someone. That's a really good start. Um, we also have our men's health and wellbeing service. So um, we recognise the unique needs of male and male identifying students when it comes to maintaining good mental health and wellbeing. And the role of the men's health and wellbeing program is to help support men in, their achieve, in achieving their own goals and what they want to get out of life. So it's kind of also aiming to bust the st stigma around men seeking support. Um, and they offer workshops, peer supported groups, men's wellbeing promotion, and also Frank the Men's Wellbeing blog they have. 
and also a specific men's counsellor. The, whoop, ooh, 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 that's not what I wanted to do. Sorry. <laughs> yep, okay, sorry. So multi-faith spiritual care service. So we have on all of our, camp, uh, sorry, on Bendigo and our Bandura campuses, we have multi-faith spiritual care centres. And within those, we have prayer locations and chill out space, spaces. Um, we also have spiritual care advisors, which are available to all campuses, and they can help you connect with your faith or spirituality of choice on campus or even in the community if you don't want to be on campus, and they can just help or guide you in your faith spiritual journey. Um, the last thing we have in wellbeing is respect at La Trobe. So this isn't a service, but it's more of a commitment to building a safe respectful and secure community together as a student and as a staff member. So um, it links up with the student's charter of rights and responsibilities, which states you have a right to live and study in a safe environment. But you also have a responsibility to treat others with respect and refrain from harming or causing offence to others with your words, actions or deeds. And we all have a responsibility to challenge unacceptable behaviour, but in a safe and respectful manner. So that's um, that's a commitment. That's what we try and promote as well at, in wellbeing at La Trobe is respect at La Trobe. Yeah, so that's about um, all of our services in wellbeing. So now I'll get into the resilience part. This is fun. So resilience is something I'm hugely passionate about and um, it's especially important during the pandemic because I'm sure you've heard the word resilience thrown about everywhere at the moment, like Dan Andrews says it daily on the news. Um, it's just a very, very important buzzword, I suppose, at the moment. Um, but outside of the pandemic, it's also something that's important during all stages of life. Um, and it can help you become happier and help you overcome life's challenges. Because <laughs> whether there is a pandemic or not, there's always going to be challenges, big or small. Um, and I'll preface it with a story of my own and how I sort of came to research resilience a hell of a lot. And it goes back to sort of my younger dating years when I was dating boys and I would break up with somebody and then I'd have a cry and, you know, call my mum and have a big sob to her. And at the end, I would always go, okay, uh, that's, you know, I've had my sob. I'm looking forward to the next stage. Even though I've just gone through this horrible experience, she would always say at the end of that phone call, wow, Maurice, you're so resilient. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> and even though I knew what resilience was, but it just sounded like such a compliment coming from my mom. And I, I didn't really understand it until I started researching it. And so I'll start with the definition of resilience. And it's the ability to navigate through or overcome adversity or challenging situations in life. So I think struggles can take anyone by surprise, but it's the ability to deal with these struggles that defines a resilient person. And it's your ability to bounce back after life tears you down. Um, it doesn't mean that these people who go through these struggles, that they haven't suffered difficulty or stress or sadness. It's just about how you deal with it and how well you recover, big or small. Um, so that takes me back to my mom and what she was saying, like my challenge was the breakup and I would get through it and be like, okay, now I can move on. Now I'm going to be happy again because I'm looking forward to the next thing. Um, and resilience also isn't something you're born with, it's a skill you can learn. And if you have a think about your own resilience, you're probably all more resilient than you think. And you can just think it back to a time where you did have a struggle and how did you get through it? So have a little bit of think about that. And did you come through it well? Did you come through it not so well? Um, what would you do differently? How would you change that? Reflect on those experiences and see what you would move forward going into your next challenge. Because there's always going to be challenges. So I'll give you another example. So say you failed a group uh, assignment. Sorry. So there's heaps of ways you can react to this and I'll give you a few. So you could blame other group members, of course. You could mope about it for a few weeks. You might give up on the unit. You might drop out of uni. 
or you might just throw a tantrum or you might take a moment to understand why you might have failed. You might talk to your professor to understand why you have failed. You might reflect and learn what your mistakes were and try and correct them. You might see if you can do any work to make up the mark. And there's no right or wrong answer here. All of those options are very valid options. Um, there's definitely healthier ways you can deal with it, but just because you experience one and not the other doesn't mean it's bad or worse. Um, so, you, for example, you might have a tantrum and blame your group members, but then you might go, okay, that might be not the right the way to go. And you might take a moment to try and understand why you failed and talk to your professor about it and try and make up the mark. So there's no right or wrong way, but dropping out of uni is definitely an extreme way and it's probably you not dealing with the situation. So um, have a think about those sort of different circumstances and how you might move forward from there. So at the moment we have, um, what's it got to do with study? So we have all of these COVID concerns and this is just at the moment. Um, in any other situation you have different concerns. You might still have those concerns coupled with COVID concerns. So there's lots of challenging circumstances, but at the moment we have, um, you know, lockdown. We have lost jobs and income. We have travel bans all around the place. We can't even leave our houses for very long sudden homeschooling, housing and rent concern. So all of these um, struggles obviously tilt the scales and you start feeling depressed, you might feel hopeless, sad, you might feel stressed and anxious, you might feel frustration, you might feel grief. Um, and we know that when we feel these things that it affects our study. Um, so we're going to have a little bit of a look about how resilience can help us manage these negative emotions to help us feel better, which will in turn help our studies. And it's not going to make the problem go away, no, like we can't just click our fingers and feel happy and the pandemic's gone, but it will manage, help us manage these feelings better. So what we're going to do is going to have a little bit of a look at some characteristics of resilient people and see what makes them tick. So first up, um, resilient people, they're mindful and aware. So this is aware of their own emotions, their emotional reactions to situations, um, even their own situations. They're aware of their behavior and their behavior towards others. Um, and they're able to present, to be pre present in the moment and that makes them calmer. And I'm not talking about being mindful um, as in you have to do meditation to be mindful. They're just mindful of what goes on in their head, in their bodies. So for example, acknowledge your feelings and how you feel right now. So, or even after this session, check in with your body. How does it feel? Is it feeling okay? Are you thirsty? Do you lack some energy? Do you need fuel for your body? Um, if you're feeling sad, is there something happening at the moment? Um, and it could just be the pandemic, just, it could be the pandemic. Um, if you feel stressed, just take notice of what's happening in your body at the time. Often when you're stressed, your heart rate goes up or you feel tense all the time. Try and release that tension and take a deep breath, but have a, have a check in with your body and see how you feel. Have a check in with your emotions and see how you feel. And the important thing here is do that without judgment. So notice what's happening. If you feel stressed, don't judge yourself because you feel stressed, just notice that you feel stressed and then try and figure out why. And once you've acknowledged what's happening in your heart or your head or your body, then ask yourself, what can I do in the moment to take care of myself? So if you are stressed, acknowledge that you're stressed, have a little think about why without judgment and then go, what can I do to take that stress away right now? And it could just be that you can't take away a presentation coming up, but you can take a deep breath and that helps you feel better. So once this sort of um, mindfulness and awareness of what's happening in your body becomes a little bit more natural um, and you're a bit more in the present moment, um, it can help you feel calmer and a little bit less reactive to situations. Um, the next one is the reflecting and learning part of it. So resilient people are able to reflect on their thoughts and their actions and their feelings 
and situations and are also able to learn from these reflections. So it can be helpful just to take time out and reflect on these things and your feelings, have a think about your feelings associated with certain situations. So ask yourself when you're in a situation, what happened? Try to look at situations from all different points of view, not just your own. Um, talk to someone you trust if you want to do that and do it all without judgment on yourself. No matter what happened, just think about what happened. Um, and this will help you develop insight and it can help you identify when and where it might be helpful to make adjustments to improve how you respond to certain situations. So resilient people are very empathetic, um, which means they're able to observe and read and share the emotions of others and act appropriately to the situation. So a good saying that some, sums up empathy a little bit is that old proverb that goes, don't judge a man until you've walked a mile in their shoes. Can you think of a time when you felt an emotion because somebody else was feeling it at the same time? So that's empathy. Perhaps, for example, your best friend lost someone close to them or your brother lost an important footy game and you felt what they were feeling to an extent. That's empathy. So resilient people are also very grateful. Um, so grateful of what they have in that moment rather than be sad or thinking about what they don't have. So it means um, so in today's society and culture of instant gratification, it's so easy to be seduced by always wanting something and always wanting something bigger and better or more. And it starts to be really easy to scan the world for the negatives in life when you get caught up in that rather than the positives. But you can, the good news is you can actually retrain your brain to naturally start scanning for the positives. And this will in turn make you happier as you become more grateful for what you do have at that time rather than looking at what you don't have. And it negates the mentality of if and then. So if I have this, then I will be happy. So resilient people can also ask for help and they know who their support systems are. So sometimes yeah, so you need to be able to ask for help when you need it as well. And sometimes we sit with our feelings and wait for someone to ask us if we're okay, which is also really important. But we should be, because because we should be asking those around us if they're okay, but sometimes that doesn't happen. And we can always also ask those people for help when we need it. And I know there can be a bit of stigma around this um, for all groups of people, but the more we do it and normalize it, the happier we will be as it comes more natural. So now we know some of the um, traits of resilient people, we're gonna look at some of the methods that we can implement in everyday life to start practicing these things. And before we jump into it, I just want to, um, in all my research, I found this book called The Resilience Project. And it's not a self-help book, but it's a collection of stories and information and evidence-based re research by Hugh Van Kylenberg, who um, is an Aussie guy who went to a remote Indian village to teach English in his early 20s and discovered that um, in this village, which had almost nothing to their names, these people, they were some of the happiest people in the world. And he studied the school children and the village and discovered that they practiced certain things each day that made them happy and resilient. And I would highly recommend this book because it's just a fabulous story about his life and his interactions and his journey of um, finding resilience as well. And he's also worked with, so he's an Aussie guy, he worked with, um, he's worked with uh, like half of the AFL football teams, he's worked with the cricket team, um, Australian cricket team, sorry, and in some of the rugby teams. So he's pretty well known throughout Australia. And he currently, like his passion is teaching um, school aged and university aged students. So he does a lot of talks um, at universities and things as well, which is good. Highly recommend it, good book. But so the principles that I'm gonna talk about are his principles of um, GEM, which is gratitude, empathy, and mindfulness. And I'm adding my own as well connection because I think that's extremely important. So we're gonna go through these. Um, so the first up is attitude of gratitude. 
So as we discussed, gratitude is focusing on what you do have, not on what you don't. And whether it comes naturally to you or not, to play, um, paying attention to life's positives can train you to see more of them throughout the day. So after the session or later on tonight, tomorrow, whatever you want, give it a go, write down three things that went well for you today. And I don't mean things that you're grateful for, because if you do this every day, you'll become grateful for the same things. Then they become like your, your family, you're grateful for your family, your friends, your you know, ability to go outside for one hour a day during the pandemic or stuff like that. They become a bit similar. So to make it a bit more specific, write down three things that went well for you today, specific to today. And then write down one thing as well that you're looking forward to about tomorrow. So if you try this for 21 days, because 21 days makes a habit, um, give it a go. And then the end of 21 days, see how you feel. It's a really good exercise of gratitude. I actually did it myself and it's, it's pretty wonderful to be honest. And it's something I will continue. I don't write them down anymore, but I always go to bed now and I think, what did go well for me today and what am I looking forward to tomorrow? It's a nice way to end the day. So empathy. Um, we discussed what empathy was before, but the practicing of empathy and putting yourself in somebody's shoes actually makes us start acting in a kinder way. And by empathizing, empathizing with another person and being kind to their situation, it actually in turn make, causes you to feel happy. So it's like a win-win situation. Um, according to research, being kind to one, one another releases oxytocin in the brain and it makes you feel joy and happiness. Um, and you can be kind to yourself as well. But doing it for somebody else releases that feel-good feelings. So it could be something as small as letting somebody in in traffic in front of you. Or it could just be shouting somebody coffee when they weren't expecting it. Like it doesn't have to be big um big big things <laughs> it could just be small little things do, during the day but seeing that somebody else's situation understanding them and making them happy makes you happy so that's a really good way to sort of lift up your mood as well um and i've done it before as well and like you even if you give somebody a present or even just like being nice to someone seeing them makes me feel ecstatic that I've made that happy person happy. So practicing empathy is something you can do every day. Just focus on one little thing and build up that skill. So you're doing it daily and that'll provide that little oxytocin boost throughout the day. It, in turn, make you happy, which is really good. Oh, yep. Yeah, so here's the exercise. So think about someone you know who might be having a hard time right now and could be yourself. But what would you say that, to them to make them feel better? So this is just another way. You could do the do something small for somebody else or you could reach out to somebody else and see if you can connect with them and just um, check in with them because that'll make you feel happy as well. So mindfulness, touched on it a little bit, but mindfulness is the ability to be present and engage in whatever you're doing, in whatever you were doing at the moment. So, um, Again, it's been about being aware of your thoughts and feelings and your movement, your body, your surroundings, and letting all of those things come and go without judgment and with acceptance. And the more you come to do this, you'll understand these thoughts, feelings, and emotions and how they actually influence each other to make you happy or sad or whatever it may be. Um, so mindfulness meditation is one way to practice mindfulness and it's a good one and there's heaps of apps and resources around at the moment even our wellbeing website has mindfulness um, recordings on it um, but it's not the only way to do it so you can go on a walk and just notice your surroundings if you're stressed or anxious for example um, leave your current surroundings that's making you feel those feelings and walk and then force myself to be present in the moment somewhere else and you can like so i go for a walk and i listen to the trees and the smells i'm sorry my building is practicing an emergency alarm <laughs> i think it's finished how embarrassing okay we'll continue so anyway go for a walk 
you don't have to do mindfulness. Um, you can listen to the trees, the smells, whatever brings you back to that moment and not thinking about the future or the past. If you're worried about the past, something that happened, bring yourself to that present moment and be in that moment. So observe your breathing, breathing observe the trees around you. One way to do it, so this is the exercise that we've come up with. So um, you can, wherever you are, take, or you, maybe you can go outside, take three deep breaths and write down one thing you can smell, two things you can feel, and three things you can see. So that just, again, it forces you to be in the present moment. So if you're um, thinking or worrying about something else, try and practice these things whenever you, maybe sort of, try, sort of try identify what's happening in that situation, but also, and make yourself mindful. So bring yourself back to that present moment. And mindfulness is, the research around mindfulness is massive as well. So, cause it can lower stress, um, restore emotional balance, increase resilience, improve sleep and improve concentration. So it's a very good thing to start practicing. And the last one is connection. So having positive social relationships and supportive environments are key to being resilient. So I'll give you a definition of connection that Brene Brown gives. And it, she says it's the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard and valued. And the science around having strong social relationships is huge. Um, but essentially having someone you can turn to or even just who you know is there for you has really strong physiological impacts on our minds and bodies and it lowers stress reactions and hormones. So feeling connected to others also helps combat loneliness and isolation, of course, which is especially important during these times. So the exercise um, that you can have a think about doing is have a think about three people who you can talk to when things get tough. And if you don't have someone you can talk to, how can you change this? Um, you can always talk to a professional. That is what they're there for, and that would be very helpful too. Um, so everybody has at least one person because there's always professional help. And again, alternative, alternatively, think about someone close to you you haven't spoken to in a while, and you could just pick up the phone call, pick up the phone and see if they're going okay. And I had a chat with our men's wellbeing counsellor lately, um, and he has said that a thing that's come up in some of his sessions is that men, especially because a lockdown is so restrictive, they haven't been getting out to do a lot of sports. And um, that is how they connect with their mates, but they did, hadn't actually occurred to them to pick up their phone and just message them to see if they're going okay. So that might be something to think about as well for everybody. It might be a good way to connect with people again. Yeah, so there's exercises there that you can practice to um, increase your resilience. So give them a go and see, see how you feel at the end of just 21 days. That's all it takes to build a bit of a habit and notice some changes. So it might be a good um, time frame to start with. But that brings me to the end of my sort of um, presentation. Um, I think everyone will always be kind and look after each other and ask your friends if they're okay. And I know it's only Monday, but man, has it been a rough week, <laughs> but we will make it. <laughs> so I hope everyone's going okay and have found something interesting from that. But um, does anyone have any questions at all? I might put this down, I think, and stop share. Rosalie, I just had one yeah. that's sort of a, a theme sort of that you're hearing a lot lately and it's it's about um being the wrong sort of optimistic i suppose that um it's, uh, I'm trying to think what they call it do you know what i'm sort of trying to say um as in like being optimistic but i suppose unrealistically optimistic i suppose that's what it's yeah can, I, I do know what you're getting at and I um I just can't I can't form it either at the moment. But is it kind of is it kind of like um, you know, if if somebody's going through something and then you sort of say, Oh, it'll be okay sort of thing, move on. Is that sort of Yeah, I guess that's what it is, or even, you know, um I guess it's about thinking about it, not acknowledging, you know, that 
there are things and like you spoke about the acknowledging being so important yeah and I guess yeah yeah definitely I think I think I know what you're talking about and I think definitely it's important to acknowledge what you're going through and just because one person has this struggle and another has another you know one even though one person's may seem um a lot have a harder struggle than another's like it, it doesn't unvalidate unvalidate is that a word it you still validate exactly those two people's feelings like um because yeah it, it's just you don't know what people are going through and one person might be sad and equally as sad as the other person even though they're going through different things so you you just have to acknowledge what the other people are going through as well and try and understand it from their point of view i think and definitely the solution is not to go and try and fix the problem um because sometimes during especially during pandemics um you know you don't want to um you don't want to what's my train of thought again i'm sorry my um alarm in the mice maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my alarm thing is really throwing me off um yeah during a pan pandemic it's just especially important um that we don't put too much pressure on ourselves to try and be too optimistic or to mm. anything because we are going through so much hardship and struggle, even if you don't have something else going on, the pandemic and the not knowing and the grief that you feel from the loss of normalcy is, um, is, is enough to make you feel really, really bad. So I think sometimes if it's all you can do to get out of bed in the morning, like that is, that is okay. <laughs> like there shouldn't be any more pressure than that if that's all you can manage that day. So I think, um, I think that's definitely important to acknowledge, um, you know, what other people are going through just because it's different from your own. Yeah. And that's exactly what I was trying to get at that whole, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, yeah. Like if you're just plain being optimistic and yeah, it, it, it overrides or minimizes right. what's actually really happening. But, and yeah. I do talk about this in my other section in a session a little bit in my coping mechanism session. Um, I think there's a lot of pressure um, on people at the moment, especially when you open up social media like Instagram, like, you know, people are making Dalgona coffees and breads and they're exercising 20 times a week, like, or, or you know, like they um, are at home doing crafts and selling something or taking up a side hustle. It's, it's just that just because we're at home all the time now, it doesn't mean that we have extra time in the day to do anything and we're still, um, you know, we open up social media, we see all these things and there shouldn't be that pressure to go and get something done if that's not what you want to do like it's yeah we don't have unlimited time and resources just because we're at home all the time for example yeah so i definitely get that and i do talk about a little, that a little bit in my um next session so it'll be good yeah thanks for the question though good one is there anything else i think um I've got some contacts if anyone wants to. Oh, something in the chat. Should I have seen that? Um. <laughs> Random act of kindness. Yeah, exactly. Good. Thanks for adding the link as well, Susie. Oh, well, that's about all I have to say. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. And thanks so much for hosting Susie and team. <laughs>